conduct responsible and safe planned burning in an effort to lower the risk of wildfire hazards. So Fred, I'd like to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Eric and Kelly, and, and thanks for that introduction. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. It is, I am quite honored to have been asked to present this session. There are numerous folks, I see some of the names of, of people attending this webinar that are, are leaders in, in Firewise in the South and other areas of the country. So to have been asked to present this material is, is quite honoring. So. Uh, again, please remember that if you have any questions, to answer, uh, to write them in the chat box and we'll get to them. And hopefully, uh, you're going to hear what you uh, intended to hear and, and make this next hour valuable for, for you and individually or your program or however you want to use this information. So I'm going to try to do my best to present this information in a way that we can uh, can move forward and you can take it and do something with it. I believe you wouldn't be attending today if you didn't have an interest in or some basic knowledge in the challenges that we talk about. Um, and Eric did a good job setting the stage a little bit uh, regarding North Carolina, but I would like to, to further that uh, and set the stage uh, even more on the regional challenges that we have in the urban interface. And to do that, we must make sure that we all kind of understand what we're here talking about today, and that's the urban interface. I want you to ask yourself, before we get into this presentation, do you consider yourself where you live or where you work as, as working or living within the urban interface? I'll ask you that question again later as we move on and, and see if your answer may have changed. But Generally speaking, the urban interface is that zone or that transition between unoccupied land or wild land in human development. There are many, many different definitions out there. Just about as many of us that are in the business, we kind of always kind of want to tweak it a little bit. But um, basically, uh, you know, we can look at it from an individual homeowner scale or a community scale when we start talking about this urban interface, and both both of those carry their own challenges and opportunities with the program. I'd like to kind of first start off with a, a, a little, pro, it's not a program, but it's a concept that I came up with that's helped with um, delivering this message, especially the Firewise message. I call it my 4R approach. And you know, folks first need to know what the risk is. And without knowing what the risk, then, then the rest of it is, is uh, we really don't have anywhere to go. But once we understand what the risk is, then we must ask ourselves, what's our responsibility to mitigate those risks? Just what is it we can do? What is it we can do to protect our homes, protect our family, protect those that we, we work with or, or um, interact with in the urban interface? And then the next R is human nature. It's what's in it for me? What, what do I get for knowing what the risk is, understanding what the responsibility is, being taking those responsible actions, it's what's in it for me. And then the very last R, I always like to temper that with respect. We must realize and understand why people moved into that urban interface, why they moved out of the cities into the country. What values do they have that they like to enjoy in that area that uh, can be, on one hand, uh, very enjoyable and, and peaceful, and on the other hand, challenging and, and has it carries its own risk as we relate it to wildfires. You know, there's over 2 billion acres in the United States. It's, that's a pretty big, pretty big elephant. But you can see on this slide here that that we are rapidly growing from a more rural country to a more urbanizing country as our population increases. Eric uh, threw out some numbers earlier about North Carolina, but you can look nationally 
you know, there are statistics that are showing that about 4,000 acres a day, close to 2 million acres a year, are, are being converted from wildland to wildland urban interface. This gives you just, a, I want to go through just a couple slides here to show you, you know, just in real life how this happens. This is a, a picture, an aerial photograph of, of an area just outside of Richmond, Virginia, back in 1965. Very little, it was all farmland, very little uh, development, but they decided to put a lake in for water resources. So they, they built this lake, they dammed it up, and then with that came development. And in the 30 years, you know, in the same area, I'll go back, you know, transferring from this, which was all uh, wild land, so to speak, in 65, to today, we have a little over 5,000 homes in this area. Almost 25,000 people now live in this environment, and this is a very typical graphic illustration of what we consider the urban interface. And this is still happening, and, and not only in Virginia, in North Carolina, South Carolina, wherever, I'll guarantee you that um, wherever you call home, this is, this is happening in your backyard. Here's another example. Here's a, an over 7,000 acre block of continuous forest land here in Virginia. And on the surface, it looks, okay, what's the problem? There's no urban interface to worry about here. Well, this is the ownership. There's 328 different owners, and there's an average of 22 acres. This will be developed at some point in time. This is our future urban interface. This is the challenges that we have, not only from the emergency response, but working with those that are moving into these areas, building their homes. Uh, building communities. How can we work in unity with these folks and so that we have the best potential of um, protecting the, those, those individuals and those homes and those improvements in the, what we call the urban interface. And wildfires, they're, they're, they happen all over. It's not just a western thing. There's an average of 41,000 fires. You know, these numbers are mind-boggling. It's, it's, it's hard to understand and grasp sometimes these numbers. We're talking just in the south, uh, and you can see the map to the right, uh, how many of these fires are occurring and how many of them involve the urban interface. Eric indicated earlier it's how many were human-caused fires. We have very few fires uh, in the the South, if you, you know, you got to take into consideration Florida, which is the lightning capital of the world, and they have quite a few. But as we move more north, uh, up towards North Carolina, South Carolina, Kentucky, and Virginia, we have very few lightning-caused fires. So anytime we have people and we have fires, the likelihood of being in the urban interface is pretty significant. Some numbers that I'm a little more familiar with that uh, I can talk about Virginia. You know, we only have about 1,100 fires a year, 12,000 acres. That's an average of just under 11 acres per fire. You know, no big deal. But those fires are impacting uh, the communities and the people that have moved out into this urban interface. Here's a map that depicts the, just the spring t fire season from last year. You're going to have to pardon me. I do have a typo. Uh, it says wildfires happen almost every day. I meant to say wildfires happened almost every day in Virginia during the spring fire season of 2014. You know, if you take away the days when it was raining or the days shortly after, about every other dry day from February, March, and April, we had fires somewhere in Virginia. And again, this is, these are Virginia statistics, but it's, it's universal. Again, I, I would be surprised if these graphs aren't uh, almost identical in some of our other uh, states that, that are represented here today on the webinar. But you can see in Virginia, we've been tracking the urban interface, or what we call woodland home development, since 1979. And it's been a, just a steady uh, increase to where we are currently dealing with almost um, 350,000 homes, a little over 5,000 communities 
that we consider woodland home communities. Yeah. And and it's wildfires are so weather related that you know it can change you know pretty quickly. This is from 2012, where just in four counties we had 20,000 acres burning here in Virginia, and a lot of that did impact the urban interface. And a lot of folks may not realize the the impact or the challenges and the the, the uh, magnitude of the problem here. You know, the big news stories are out west. You see the big fires and the big you know communities that are impacted by fires, but. Look at this map here. Look at look at the red areas. That's the urban interface, the red and yellow areas east of the Mississippi. You know, again, Eric pointed out that North Carolina is number one for the number of acres and percentage of acres that are in the urban interface. This map shows that very clearly. But it also shows the challenges that we have up and down the whole east coast, not only in the south. And this, this map may be a little bit hard for you to see the very tiny little dots, but if you look at the structures lost from 1999 to 2011, there isn't a single state in the nation that didn't lose at least one structure. And you can see, of course, California, the Pacific Northwest, Texas, you know, with having, you know, just a, a large number of homes that are burned. And, and the, the east is not immune to it. Look at the look at those large circles uh, in North Carolina, in South Carolina, all the way up into New Jersey. You know, of course, Florida. So this is not just a Western problem. This is a problem that that we all here in the South need to realize and address. Again, just another way of looking at these numbers. Uh, you know, like I said, you can kind of divide this pie up in in a, a dozen different ways. But this kind of just gives you an idea of the number of structures that are lost uh, in the urban interface in the last several years. I think the the very um, eye-opening statistic to look at is that an average of almost 3,000 homes are lost per year uh, to to wildfire nationally. Remember, I asked you earlier if you uh, lived in the what is considered the urban interface. Well, you can see that you know that there are 46 million homes nationally in the urban interface, and if you don't currently live in the urban interface, it looks like there's another 8 million new homes are projected to be built in the urban interface in the next 10 years. So this this challenge that we have is is not going away. It's just going to compound itself, and we need to. As, as all the different state programs and national programs have done, is, is begin addressing this and giving you, know, you the homeowners, the landowners, the, the property owners, the, the folks that are, that are working uh, to mitigate these challenges, give you the tools and the information to, to address the situation. Again, this, I, I can't help but keep trying to emphasize that this is not a Western problem. Look, look at this, in 2013, would you have thought that North Carolina was number two in the nation for the number of wildfires, just right behind California? And then look at the top ten. There's four southern states there, North Carolina, Georgia, South Carolina, and Alabama. The positive side, if there is one, look at the, the right-hand part of the graph. It talks about the acres burned in those wildfires. You know, we may have lots and lots of fires, but the fuels that we have, the conditions that we have, are dramatically different. And so we aren't losing the, the big chunks of land to fires. So, so even though we have four of the top ten states for numbers of fires, none of the southern states show on that side of the graph. So um, you know, that's, that, that's a plus for us. And, and again, it's, you know, it's right here in our backyard. Since 2006, there's been over 250 homes you know, damaged or destroyed in North Carolina. You know, a five-year average, there's you know, 45 homes and 55 other buildings in South Carolina. You know, Virginia has these same kind of numbers. Those are just the three states I'm going to focus on uh, and I talk, but I could be interjecting in statistics from just about any other state in the South or in the East. 
Okay, now that we've sort of set the stage, I would like to kind of get to what you may have, you know, really anticipated coming to this webinar for, is talking about, you know, what is the urban interface and what must be considered when building in the urban interface. And I'm going to kind of divide that elephant up into some smaller bites, and we're going to look at how homes ignite. We're going to look at firewise construction, firewise landscaping, and then look at some of the, the programs and tools that are out there to help you um, make some changes and, and take action uh, to, to reduce your risk in the urban interface. So first, let's look at how homes ignite. Yeah, I think uh, this is going to come out at some point in time, so now is just as good of a time as anything. There always is that challenge. Um, and you know, I know that for some folks, it's like ruffling their feathers. <laughs> Pardon the little picture on these. It's a poor little chicken with his little feathers all ruffled up. But there is that, that traditional challenge or um, misconception that uh, Smokey Bear and all this problem we have with wildland urban interface and fires is Smokey Bear's fault. It's the fault of the, the um, society wanting to put a stop to all wildfires. And we don't have the time in this webinar to get into the, the, all the aspects of the good fire and bad fire. But, but they're, they're, you know, having reducing the number of fires and the acres it burned has had an impact in the fuel buildup that these fires can can start in, ignite in, and and build strength and grow. So, so there is a little bit of of, of truth in that the the fire reduction or the wanting to eliminate wildland fire since the early uh, 1900s uh, has had some impact, but it's not. You know, it's not just one reason why. We can't just point to Smokey Bear or those of us in the prevention uh, community and say it's your fault that that we have all these fuels build up. There's enough um, enough to go around that we all have some some responsibility to to mitigate that. And that's what we're here to talk about. It's not what's happened in the past. It's where we can go in the future. So again, looking at how homes ignite, it's we must realize that uh, first, you know, you know, fire itself is is dependent on what it has to burn, the weather, the terrain, if it's flat or if it's mountainous. All these different aspects um, have a significant impact on on the vulnerability of a home. There's you know, there's some terms that we must first talk about uh, when we start talking about fuels. I used the word fuels earlier, and, and we need to understand that basically fuels are anything that burns. It's the vegetation, it's the homes itself, and and how they are um, structured really has a, quite an impact on the, again, the impact on the home's vulnerability. And we're going to probably point to this more times than not, that it, it's not these huge, big mega fires that come roaring through an, an area that consume homes and, and gobble them up like a, a dragon, so to speak. It's, it's, it's more the, the smaller uh, fires. It's the, the something, you know, sparks themselves that get into the um, areas of homes and, and ignite a structure. So it's the little things that can make a big difference. And I put this slide up to you because I, I really wanted you to understand also the, the weather conditions, specifically drought conditions, has a tremendous impact on, on fire ignition and in, it, in itself then can have an impact on, on the, 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 the threat to homes, home damage. And I'm sorry for having trying to put a, a, um, a course of fire behavior uh, in a short period of time, but I think it's important that you realize that there are so many things that come into play when we start looking about how a home ignites. Not so much the home itself. It could be where the home's placed. Is it on flat land? Does it have a lot of slope or topography? Is it built on the side of a mountain? Is it, is it at the top of a draw that, that acts like a chimney that if there is a fire, the fire can run up slope and, and um, uh, you know, 
burn structures and, and, and threaten folks that live in, and work in those areas. So, so we have to take into consideration that as well. There's going to be a series of um, slides with ULRs listed, links. The, all these links are going to be provided to you in another document, uh, I was uh, told. So you really shouldn't have to try to write down these links. Um, but also the presentation will be made available to um, as a recorded, so you can go back later. But um, there's a really, really good um, video that I think I would encourage you to watch. And it's out of the research center on looking at ember tests. And they basically built a house and put a lot of uh, embers out there and just saw what, how that home in, in, you know, ignited. What was igniting on that house? Uh, in this picture here, you can see just the, the, the thousands and thousands of, of embers that come off of a typical fire. And the structure that you see you know, had some of the worst case scenarios, had, um, you know, a wood siding that could easily ignite. But as the picture shows, it, it's not so much the, the material, the, 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 the side of the house the, that's catching on fire. It's the vegetation that's right up against the house. It's the mulch beds. It's the small things that these the sparks can get into. It's the leaf litter or the pine straw in the gutters of the roof that, that will catch an ember and, and you know, ignite and then have a fire start building and growing. And from that, it, it uh, puts more heat and, and more intensity into the structure itself and then catches the, the uh, actual building materials on fire. So, so when we're looking about how, how homes ignite, we must first look at the little things and, and realize that just like the saying says, you know, a fire starts with a single, single match or a single spark. And that's exactly true here. So let's step away from um, how homes ignite. And you know, our whole goal is, is to reduce the threat of wildfire to our, our homes. And to do that, we must first you know, understand what it is we're dealing with. I, I've hopefully done a, a fair job of setting the stage for you to understand you know, how homes ignite, a little bit about fire and you know, how sparks start a fire and, and, and such. But we must really look at, at the potential that is our home itself or the area around our house and evaluate it to see, in fact, you know, where our priorities need to be placed, what it is we need to do, where can we get our biggest gain for our least amount of work. Um, I can assure you that every state out there, no matter where you're from, has some assessment form that they use. There is a national form. Here, here is uh, one that's used uh, from the NFPA folks that, that several organizations and states use. Then there are forms, and I'm showing you one here that's a Virginia-specific form that evaluates the structure and the area around it. Like I said, this is, I'm not going to go over this form. I'm just letting you know that there are tools out there to help you evaluate your home and your community to, to see what level of risk it is. Uh, every one of the fire, state firewise web pages, the national web page, you know, there is some uh, assessment tool online that either can be printed out and used or used online. And I encourage you to start off with your local state agency and then uh, look and see what's there, and then look outside and look and see what your neighboring state has, or look for the national programs. Again, there's no one right way or one way that's better than others. It's just different tools that have been designed by different folks uh, to, to facilitate their needs. There's another term you may hear. It's a community wildland protection plan. Again, this is a cover from one here in Virginia where the forestry folks and mitigation specialists work with homeowners and the community to, to assess their risk and to identify areas that they can mitigate to reduce their uh, chances of wildfire. So, so again, I encourage you to, to look to your forestry office in your state and, and see what tools are available from them. 
there's a wonderful tool that has just recently been launched from the, the Southern Group of State Foresters. It's called, the, it's called SouthRAP for short, but it's the Southern Wildfire Risk. Again, this is a ULR. I really encourage everybody, if you're listening to this webinar and you haven't gone to this site, you, know, you need to um, go and look at it. If not right after the webinar, you need to do it tomorrow before you forget about it. Uh, there's uh, different levels of applications. There's a public viewer, a professional viewer, and then there's a community at risk. But down at the lowest common denominator, the public viewer, you can go here and you can zoom into your house your backyard, your community, and see what your level of risk is, and then get some get some suggestions on how you can mitigate that that risk for wildfire. So again, this this tool in itself is brand new, and it's going to change the game, so to speak, in developing plans um, for individual homeowners as well as communities in the urban interface. Okay, we talked a lot about the home and stuff, but let's let's go out our front door or back door, and, and let's go out into the things that are beyond the, the the brick and mortar of the house itself. You know, we we also have to to look at what we call the the zone concept, or the it's called the home ignition zone, and and as just as we walk out our door, the, you know, there's things that are that what we call zone one, and some some localities or some states may do three zones, some may do four. In this picture here, we're looking at four zones. You know, from right up against the house to to further and further away from your home. And there's things that you can do to again reduce the the potential for having a catastrophic fire. Uh, impacting your home. I am never going to say that if you do everything that you get told to do in FireWise or state program that your house is going to be protected from wildfire. There, there's no 100% there's no guarantee in this program. There's things that we can do to give your house the best chance possible to be defended um, from a, a wildfire. But there are, you know, there's the worst case scenario. There's the perfect storm that, that uh, there's, there's a little we can do except evacuate when we get told to evacuate, and that's critical that we need to, that needs to be part of our process and our thinking process as well. So, but there are things that we can do. I, I did a poster not too long ago, and I tried to relate it to things that, that, that are common knowledge in society, and especially when talking to kids. You know, every one of us, when we're in school, when the fire department comes and talks to us, they talk about, you know, if you, you catch your clothes on fire, you know, you stop, drop, and roll. Well, I developed this poster that says your house can't stop, drop, and roll. It needs help. You know, we need to help our homes and our structures to protect them from the threat of wildfire. So again, this whole concept of this home ignition zone is nothing more than looking at your house, looking at, you know, your structure, the garages, the barns, and seeing where the potential lies for for uh, having a fire that can build up in strength and intensity that will, um, you know, uh, negatively impact our home. And the, again, you know, these zones, a lot of people fear that, oh, to be fire wise or to be, um, you know, pr protected, I need to, it needs to be like a desert. Well, it, that, that's far from the truth. You can have a beautiful landscape, and you can have shrubs, and you can have plants, and you can have trees. You just need to have them, you know, managed and maintained and put the right plant in the right place uh, to, to give, again, give your home and give you and your family and the things that you value the best possible chance. Again, these home ignition zones can be uh, looked at in many, many different ways. We're going to to move on because uh, I don't need to dwell on that a little bit. And I'm running just a little bit late. <laughs> uh, again, embers. Again, these, it's amazing the number of embers that come off of fires and and how they can carry for great distances and land and, and cause cause fires. Again, you know the, the fires can build. You know, this is what we call a crown fire, and so many people think it's these kind of fires that consume homes. It's this huge wall of fire that's going to come in and, and, and burn up our community. 
And I'm not saying that does not happen. You know, it, it has the potential. But what I um, what I really want us to, to focus on is is the, um, the the smaller, the lower intensity fires. And I'll show you a, a picture here just shortly. A lot of people say that yeah, I can do everything for my house, but what about my neighbors? If I do everything I need to do, but my neighbor, where our zones overlap, they aren't doing anything, or they aren't they aren't helping the situation. Well, that's where we have to um, really work with the community at whole and, and, and find out why or what it is we can do to encourage everybody within that community to, to do what they can to to better prepare that the community as a whole uh, to, to mitigate the wildfire hazards. Uh, that does not undermine that, you know, that if you can't get everybody on your block to do what uh, is, is recommended, that you shouldn't do, you know, you should look out for your own backyard. Well, that's far from the truth. You know, every little bit that we do uh, can have a tremendous impact. Quickly looking at Firewise construction, the only thing I want to talk about here, and, and I'm only going to spend a little bit of time because of everything that we talk about, if you're living in a home currently, for me to or any Firewise specialist or mitigation specialist to come and say that you need to put a new roof on or you need to put new siding on, you know, because it's a, your house is in, in danger, that's really beyond the capabilities of many of us. We don't have the ability to go put a new roof on. Um, unless, you know, this comes into play when it comes time to replace that roof or we're going to do some modifications or, or upkeep to our homes. That's when we need to look at the construction of that structure and see if there's anything we can change to make it more defendable. Um, and then, of course, when we have new construction in an area, we can, um, you know, that's the time to talk about from the ground up how we can build a home uh, in, in with these firewise concepts. And we must realize that anything that's attached to our home is part of our home. There's many cases where, as this privacy fence in the lower left shows, where it catches on fire and then it basically acts like dominoes, where it just carries that fire from the wildland closer to the home and then finally burns the home structure itself. The picture up in the upper right-hand corner was was a, uh, a wildfire. You can see that there's no fire up against the house uh, except on the deck. There was an ember landed on some pine needles that were on this deck of this house. And that in itself caused the fire to grab hold, take hold, and, and burn the structure. Okay, so we're going we're gonna, to, like I said, there's plenty of information that you can go and find online if you're going to go uh, and discuss, you know, want to look in more about the con um, construction aspect of it. But I do want to, you know, firewise landscaping, that's where we can make a real difference. That's where we as individuals can spend a little bit of time and a little bit of effort and a little bit of money and make a major uh, impact on, on uh, reducing the threat to, to our homes in the urban interface. And it's fun. We all, we all like getting out and playing in the dirt. And especially this time of year, when you're in, in stores and the big box stores or nurseries and start looking for what plants you're going to plant or what shrubs you're going to you know, think about planting, now's the time to be thinking about the vegetation. Is it is a flammable plant? Is it something that's going to easily catch on fire? I'm going to show you shortly a ULR that you can go to that kind of help you walk through the process and, and determine whether that vegetation is highly flammable or not. But again, these the closer to your home, the more fire resistant that plant needs to be. But no matter what we plant or where we plant it, if we don't maintain it and there a drought comes and it doesn't kept isn't kept watered and green, then you know, it, it then turns into more fuel and can just exacerbate the problem than than be a benefit for us. So we must realize that yeah, we can have vegetation and shrubs up against our home but we really need to maintain it. Here's the picture I wanted to show you. This is very, very unusual to catch a, a series of pictures like this, uh, but it really should. This is a home. It may be hard to see, but there's a, a fire, a wildfire in the, the background. It's, it's, it's still a ways away from the house. But here's the house, and here's that same house 
that uh, has now been consumed by the wildfire. Let's look at it a little, uh, blow it up a little bit, and I can, the arrows point to the, the windows, give you some reference points. So this is the, look at the, look at the house, there's the windows. What, what do you see besides a house that's fully enga engaged in a fire? Do you, is there anything else, you know, striking? Do you, do you pick up on anything? Look at the trees. The trees aren't consumed. It's not this huge wall of fire that went through and burned the crowns up. This fire basically found a foothold in the ground vegetation and, and carried itself all the way to the structure and then got on the roof of the structure and, and caused this home to burn. So again, this is a, a very, I think, a very powerful picture showing that um, that it's, it's not, you know, this huge fire wall that comes and catches houses. And then quickly, again, just because I know you're going to be provided a, a, a document you can download with all these ULRs, there's tons of information out there. You know, you could do Google search and, and, and be lost for days in, in what's out there. But I'm just going to share with you a couple that I think are really very, very good and great places to start. The Southern Forest Experimental Station has a great series of, of um, brochures and fact sheets that will help you, guide you into uh, reducing the risk uh, to wildfires around your home and what you can do uh, in you know, living and working in the urban interface. This is the one that, that uh, I really encourage you to go to. It was designed and developed um, out of uh, really West Virginia and Ohio, but it's relevant uh, if you live in Georgia or Florida or, or Mississippi or, or California. You know, it may talk about different kinds of species of plants, but the the process that goes into identifying whether they're fire resistant or not is dissimilar. But this this is a plant selector guide that is fairly new that is covers most of the vegetation east in the eastern United States. So again, I, I really encourage you to, to spend a little bit of time playing around with this site, and I think you'll find it a, a wonderful tool. All right, quickly moving into FireWise and the Fire National FireWise programs. Eric did mention that earlier, and it is a wonderful program. There's, um, you know, first off, the, the term FireWise has been around a while. A lot of people use it in, in different contexts. But it's basically, you know, as it says, it's, it's you know, it's, it's a content, it's, it's a program where becoming ready for wildfire or being knowledgeable about the risk that you have where you live um, as it's connected to, to wildfires. There are, um, you know, this wise regarding fire. Yeah. Um, again, I want to really emphasize that, you know, all this information, and if you do everything we say, you know, all you can do is give you, you know, the best chance possible. There's so many other programs out there. There's Ready, Set, Go. It's a wonderful program. There's another term you may hear, Fire Adapted Communities. All this stuff can be an information overload for you. And that's where your state forestry agencies and, and folks like the Extension Service and universities can really uh, help you. Uh, there, I like to think of us as being information brokers. It's our job to get the information to you. So I'm going to move along because I really want to spend some time uh, answering questions. Again, these are the, the various different programs that are out there. Here's yet another reference guide on, on wild and urban interface, a wonderful tool. There's numerous documents out there. Again, uh, please take time to download this presentation after today and look at these different ULRs or download the document that has them and spend some time uh, maybe not knowing all the answers, but maybe finding out just what questions you need to ask when you talk to, to your experts that can help you, guide you through this process. Here's a picture I really want to share with you from South Carolina. Look at this community. Look at the wildland. That were those trees backed up to those several homes that burned. That's you know this is a wildland urban interface community. You know it's, it, this is what we're trying to do and, and protect against. And you can see where the trees were butt up right up against the homes. They uh, you know they were at highest risk and they in fact were succumbed to the wildfire. But you also notice on the right hand side there's a couple 
um, homes over there that, that were not up against the forest, but they also did burn. I don't know for sure. I, I know that there's somebody on, on the webinar. I see his name. He's very knowledgeable of this fire. He may know exactly why those couple homes to the right burned. But I'll guarantee you it probably had to do something with the vegetation, something to do with the construction of that home that allowed an ember from that large wildfire to the upper right to land in those homes and uh, ignite the structures. Again, please seek out your FireWise coordinators in your state. These are folks such as myself and Gary Wood in North Carolina along with Eric. You know, these are our folks that can really help you uh, move through the process of what you can do. And you know, I want to sort of end close to ending with this, with this comment here. It, it says, you know, with public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. Consequently, he who molds public sentiment goes deeper than he who enacts statutes or pronounces decisions. You know, we can't pass laws that's going to make people do this. We got to engage with the community and with the individual homeowners and, and, and educate them of what it is that needs to be done so they have ownership into it. This is not brand new. This concept of engaging the society and not just making a law or, or a, a proclamation to, to save everybody from the ills of society. This actually was a, a remark made by Lincoln in a debate with Douglas back in 1858. So this concept's been around for a while. OK, as we're getting ready to wrap up, I, I uh, hope this is, this is maybe what you're thinking. Because if you are, then I've been successful. That that uh, you I, I kept your your interest up and your your uh, thought process going and hopefully you've been asking some questions in the chat box and we're going to get to those here shortly um, Kelly and Eric but again I do want to to really emphasize how much this was an honor and privilege to be asked by the folks of NC State and, and the rest of of, of the um, organizers of this series to allow me to to come into your your world today for, for an hour. So, okay, this uh, is Addie Thornton, also working with Kelly at NC State. Um, thank you, Fred, so much for that great presentation. A lot of really good resources. Um, I'm going to uh, copy and paste those URLs that Fred was talking about into the chat box. And we're also going to post them on the main page of the webinar when you join today. And this webinar is archived for one year. So you'll be able to get to that page and also watch the webinar and listen to it again if you need to for up to one year. Um, right now, I'm going to go ahead and push out the short quiz. Um, it's going to push it into everyone's um, web browser, so it will automatically pull up a tab in your browser with the quiz. Um, please feel free to stay on the webinar and um, participate in the question and answer session right now with Fred. But um, just so you know, right now I'm going to push out the quiz so that um, everybody uh, can take that. And you must take that to get your continuing education credits. So you should see that um, in the next couple of minutes loading on your browsers. And if it doesn't work for anyone, I will also paste it into the chat box. And you can access it through the chat box at the end of the webinar. So um, thanks again, Fred. And right now, I'll turn it to Eric to uh, monitor some of these questions, if anybody has any, um, to speak with Fred about. Thank you. Th thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Fred. That was a very uh, informational program that you put on there. Um, I did see just basically one comment about that uh, with the two houses burned on the opposite side of the lake, opposite where the fire was. Someone had suggested that embers landed in pine straw beds next to the homes. And that was Michael Bazo suggested that. Um, I didn't see any questions come up in the chat box. So if there are questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. And Fred and I will address them. And then also, Eric, you know, again, I put my contact information there. And uh, I really don't care if you live in California, Alaska, South Carolina, North Carolina. If you, if you feel I can help you with anything or point you in the right direction, please contact me. And Addie is currently doing a fantastic job of getting those URLs put into the chat box line. And uh, so we do have a question from Ronald Farr. How often do you see urban interface problems in deciduous forests? 
we do have, I mean, they, they carry their own own challenges. Uh, deciduous forest, you know, it's not immune to, to the ch uh, fires we have, especially in the fall of the year with the, leaf, the leaves that fall and, and um, you know, if you don't rake the leaves away from the structures, it doesn't have to be pine straw in the gutters of your roof or in the, the valleys of the, the your, your structure or up underneath your decks. It can just be the, the oak leaves or maple leaves. So you do have uh, the same type of problem. Maybe the, the intensity of it or the severity of it is le lessened, but um, it, it, is, it is a concern. Uh, and you do need to take the same kind of precautions when building or maintaining your structure in the urban interface. And we have the same thing here in, in western North Carolina. We've got, you know, a lot of uh, Appalachian hardwood forests. We've got uh, mixed stands and that kind of thing. I, I know that my gutters fill every spring with the uh, cast-offs of the uh, tulip poplars that we have. So that, that's something that I've always got to make sure I'm getting out of my gutters. So there's still possibility for that even in the deciduous forests. Thank you for the question, Ronald. Anything else? Any other questions? On the photo that showed fire encroaching on the house, did it have a wood shingle roof? Yes, it did. And regardless of North Carolina, we still have some homeowners associations that require wood shake roofs. Um, a question from Randolph Harrison. What is the occurrence potential of crown fires in hardwoods here in the east? Hi, Randall. Uh, I think I know you. Um, but there, there is that potential. I mean, I have seen that under extreme conditions, especially in these areas where we have uh, large insect and disease uh, problems, uh, gypsy moth damage, uh, specifically where, where fires can get in the ground. But that's, that's negligible, but it's not unheard of. Most of the crown fires are in the, the conifer forests that we have. And Eddie has posted a link to the quiz as there's been some problems with the quiz popping up in the browser. So if you're looking for that, you can look in the chat box where Eddie has posted that. Are there any more questions out there? Well, I'd like to thank NC State for helping put this on with the North Carolina Forest Service and Fred with the Virginia Division of Forestry for helping and providing us all this great information today. Um, thank you all for joining. That's really what makes these programs work is if we get people that are interested and, and want that kind of information, uh, it's, it's a great way to do it. Eddie, Kelly, do you guys have anything to add? Um, I just want to thank everyone also for coming today. Thank you, Eric, for moderating. Um, I want to announce that the, um, this is a series, so we will have two more webinars in this urban um, forestry series. And the next one, the topic is emergency planning on April 30th. So um, it's the same format in this webinar portal. Um, so we hope to see uh, you and anyone else interested there in April. And Thanks again. And uh, like Fred said, um, please feel free to contact him with his contact information because he can answer any questions um, further from now. Thank you, Addie. Thank you, Kelly. Aaron. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. Eddie, you did have one more mention here oh. from uh, Gregory Marshall that he wasn't yeah, able to take the quiz. That. I'm going to try to send it to him again and see if that won't work. Other than that, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Have a great afternoon. Thank thanks, you. Fred. Thank you. Bye-bye.